Within recent years, one of the biggest technical progressions we've seen in smartphones is 5G, the newest form of network connectivity promising to massively increase speeds from the 4G LTE of the past decade. And while there's no questioning that 5G is the future, the rollout is doomed to be slow due to the short range of towers and the fact that 4G really isn't actually that bad, at least for the most part, so the demand, while it's there, it isn't super high. But looking at the jump from 3G to 4G, now that was huge huge. It was able to take place pretty quickly in the early 2010s as smartphone tech was rapidly advancing. And when the iPhone 5 moved to 4G in 2012, it was clear that it was now the industry standard. But the iPhone wasn't the first to get 4G, just like it wasn't the first to get 5G. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and this here is the HTC Thunderbolt, one of the very first phones capable of 4G networking. Today, let's take a look at the phone's story and how it holds up 10 years later. Introducing the Thunderbolt by HTC. Immense power, scorching speed. The first phone strong enough to run on the fastest, most advanced 4G network in America. If you've been watching this channel for a while and you think this phone seems familiar, that's because I actually talked about it a while back before I even purchased it in my worst smartphone failures video, which I'll link in the description. Unfortunately, that's a pretty ominous giveaway to what this video will be about, but odds are I'll have the word failure or disaster in the title for clickbait reasons anyways, so I doubt you're too surprised to hear it. This phone, uh, it's not great. Interestingly, the HTC Thunderbolt actually wasn't the first commercially available 4G smartphone. As that title belongs to the HTC Evo 4G, which came out in 2010, and it was marketed as Sprint's flagship Android. Well, actually, apparently in 2008, the HTC Max 4G came out in Russia, but I wouldn't consider it relevant due to its limited market. It also did not run Android. So yes, the HTC Evo 4G was the first Android 4G smartphone. So why am I looking at the Thunderbolt? Well, the 4G that the Evo used actually wasn't the LTE we're familiar with. Through Sprint, it used WiMAX, assuming that's how you say it, which is a different form of connectivity when it comes to 4G, and one that isn't as strong as LTE, which is what we still use today. That Evo 4G looked really good on paper, with a great big 4.3 inch 480p display, a 2000 mAh battery, top of the line specs, an 8 megapixel camera, except kind of like 5G nowadays. Around the time of the Evo, Sprint's coverage for 4G was very limited, which means that even with this newer phone, you would be using 3G like normal. In the the vast majority of locations and situations. Ultimately, all this along with a lot of the criticisms towards many of the phone's shortcomings makes it a device that people tend to ignore when it comes to smartphone history, even if the Thunderbolt might not have performed much better. Launched in early 2011, it was capable of using actual 4G LTE with the Verizon wireless network and received the hype you would expect for such a breakthrough device. Early demand was through the roof and pre-sales records were broken for at least one online vendor as tech enthusiasts eagerly awaited the jump forward in network technology on a phone that looked pretty great for early 2011. This phone came out not long after the iPhone 4, and looking at them side by side, it's easy to say that it actually kind of holds up. These were still very much the days where iPhones were very ahead of the time, with the retina display in particular on the iPhone looking significantly better. iPhone was definitely ahead of the game, and this is all worth noting because despite the display, HTC wanted to stand out in the market, offering not only a much bigger phone than the iPhone, Phone, but also one with better networking capabilities. And the lower resolution was probably a good thing considering the awful battery life, but we'll get to that. For Android users, this was a phone to be excited for, making it all the more disappointing when it inevitably flopped. Features like Skype were removed just prior to release, and the timeline for software updates would be absolutely horrible, although it would ship with Android 2.2 and be updated to Android 4.04 Ice Cream Sandwich, so two years of updates, pretty super typical for the time. And I don't really have a problem there. It just wasn't very consistent when it came to the timing of said updates. That battery life though, with any jump in networking, you have the phone drawing more power than beforehand, and with a small 1400 milliamp hour battery, you can pretty much easily understand how that would end up going. Users would quickly complain about the short life, and unfortunately nothing was ever really done to rectify that. Although if it helps, like any of these old androids, it's easy to take off the back panel and swap the battery if you need to. So enough about all the context, let's take a look 
look at the design of this phone. It just screams early 2010s when you take a look at it from the front with that classic HTC flip clock widget and navigation buttons along the bottom on both the bezel and the screen. Above the display, you have the Verizon logo in the black bezel, and above that, you have the selfie camera and speaker for phone calls. It also lights up there for notifications in typical Android fashion. Flipping to the back, we get a matte black plastic panel with an actual kickstand near the bottom on a more silver piece. Flipping it out, we actually see the rear firing speaker, and I have to say, this is pretty darn cool. I didn't realize phones actually sometimes included kickstands built in, and I can see how that would be useful for watching YouTube or whatever else you felt like doing, perhaps utilizing the blazing fast 4G internet speeds, at least until your battery dies or you run out of data from your extremely expensive cell phone plan. I remember back in the day with my HTC Wildfire S around 2011, 2012, I think I had a full five megabytes of available data. We have the HTC logo embedded in metallic letters in the middle and a 4G LTE symbol printed proudly above the stand. And that makes sense given how much of a flex that would have been when this phone came out. On the stand itself, there's a faint with Google wordmark to remind you that this was indeed an Android. The camera sensor is offset a bit to the left from the top center with two flashes beside it, which is interesting. The phone has a curvature to it, and as such, it feels pretty good in the hand. On the top of the phone, we have the headphone jack and power button. On the right side, the volume buttons, and on the bottom, nothing. The charging port is actually on the left side for some reason. Interestingly, perfectly lined up with the kickstand. I can't tell if there is a specific reason for this, because if you want to charge your phone while standing it up, it's really awkward, and the port would have made a lot more sense on the other side, or, you know, the bottom, or even the top. But not really sure what HTC was going for here, although I guess you can stand up the phone vertically, and doing so makes the charger not so awkward, even though actually using the phone is. The phone itself is a bit chunky in today's context, but honestly fairly light, and really not too bad feeling in the hand. I wouldn't want to use a case with it, as it's already thick enough, but honestly it feels pretty sturdy to me, and I don't mind it. The screen at 4.3 inches is pretty large for the time, and I like it a lot. The display is definitely a bit blurry and pixelated, but again, 2011 Android. This feels like a very premium smartphone from a decade ago, and the specs more or less would match this, being pretty top of the line for the time. We have a second generation 1 gigahertz Snapdragon processor and 768 megabytes of RAM. There's 8 gigs of internal storage as well as a micro SD card slot, so that's nice. Or at least it would be nice if I could use the space. But taking photos, it forces you to use an SD card, and there's no way that I can find at least to change the location of where photos are saved. So even though there's multiple gigabytes free, I guess they are reserved for the system, and I need to actually use an SD card for this, so that annoyed me, but is what it is. The cameras are really bad by today's standards, but the specs are typical, if not good, for 2011. The rear sensor is 8 megapixels and can record video in 720p, and photos being seen here are just not good. There's, uh, yeah, no, they're bad. <laughs> There's not much other way to put it. It is a 2011 smartphone, so what can you expect? And the front-facing camera is significantly worse, with 1.3 megapixels. So this is just an ugly photo, and at least half of that is because of the phone, not just my face. That video in 720p is definitely old-looking, kind of nostalgic in that you can tell it's an old smartphone video, but uh, not something I'd want to use anymore. And overall, the tech specs are, you know, of the era. It'd all be a much more complete package if it actually had good or even mediocre battery life, but it doesn't, and using 4G, you would be in pain as your battery life slipped away faster than your new networking speeds. This was really the major downfall of the phone, and HTC and Verizon's widespread marketing just wasn't enough to make it ever mainstream in the public eye. The phone just screamed of mediocrity from top to bottom, not really standing out in any way except for one thing, the 4G LTE, and that's it. That wasn't good enough, just like in recent years, slapping 5G to the end of the name of your phone isn't enough to make it good, much less great. Seriously, think of all the phones in the last couple of years that have just put 5G at the end for fun. The phone rightfully failed, as the hardware just wasn't ready for the new tech. But I'll say it, I still find the phone really cool. It's one of the better looking Androids of the early 2010s, at least in my opinion, and the historical significance it carries will in the very least keep it from ever being completely forgotten, something not a lot of other smartphones can say, especially from HTC. It's sad to see how fast HTC went from one of the biggest Android makers to being almost completely irrelevant a decade later, but they couldn't keep up with Samsung and Apple among others, and just fell off as time stretched on. But whatever HTC's future holds, the Thunderbolt 4G will always be remembered for being the first smartphone of the 4G era, for better or more likely for worse,
course, given how it performed, but it was still most certainly innovative. I'm glad we got to take a look at it today. And before we finish this up here, I do have to talk about the software a little bit because man, I find the whole HTC Sense experience so cool. You slide this ring to unlock and then we get this ultra hip dark UI with a wavy red background. The app icons are hilariously ugly. There's no design structure at all and it's just all so terrible. Although hey, the phone is basically preset in dark mode, which is awesome. And I don't know why this trend didn't seem to continue throughout most of the 2010s. There's a pre-installed flashlight app. That's right, an app solely for the flashlight. Do you remember those? I remember back in the day on my HTC going to the camera and just leaving the flash on for a flashlight because a lot of those flashlight apps from the Play Store would ask you for a lot of sketchy privacy things like they would want to see your contacts and blah blah blah. It was just really weird. There's a camcorder app because <laughs> what would you use to record video? The camera app? <laughs> no. There's multiple themes to pick through with the preset one being called Verizon Scene. We've also got HTC, social, work, play, and even travel. You've got a theme for every occasion, and that's a phone seller if I've ever seen one. The phone is full of pre-installed bloatware. It's pretty bad. But with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. I could probably spend a whole video looking at all the quirks of HTC Sense, but maybe we'll save that for another time. I had a lot of fun looking at the Thunderbolts, and hopefully you all enjoyed watching. And if you did, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. You can follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at 91 underscore tech if you'd like to for some reason. And and as always, Discord server link in the description if you feel like talking some tech. And with that all being said, thank you so much for watching. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.